Only in America. 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 Welcome to Only in America. I'm Ali Narani. This week we're talking travel, culture, and community with an award-winning restaurateur. Everything we do here is to show that we're all the same. Fundamentally want the same things, education for our children, good food on our table, and jobs um, that give back to the community. Like, we all want the same things, so how could we possibly shut our doors to people just like us? From the National Immigration Forum, I'm Ali Nirani. Now, I grew up in Salinas, California. My parents immigrated to the States from Pakistan. Back then, Salinas, California did not have a very big, if any kind of a, South Asian community. So what that meant was that every month or two, the family would pile into the station wagon, drive six hours south, and go to my mom's favorite Indian grocery store in Los Angeles. I grew up going to these grocery stores, understanding them based on their smell and you know, buying the right kind of rice, the right spices, all so that at the end of the day, my mom would time and time again put some incredible dishes on the dinner table. That was me growing up. Well, a recent YouGov survey found that Americans see food as the number one benefit of immigration, with 50% of respondents agreeing that their community's food scene has benefited from immigration. This phenomenon isn't uniquely American. YouGov asked this question in seven European nations as well, and food was the top answer in almost every country. Now, a couple foreign dishes may not change anyone's mind in the immigration debate, but they are a simple way to make a genuine connection with immigrant communities. And when divisive rhetoric is driving much of the world's immigration narrative, these kinds of connections are absolutely priceless. Support for the National Immigration Forum comes from the James Irvine Foundation, expanding opportunity for the people of California, and from the Carnegie Corporation of New York, established in 1911 by Andrew Carnegie to promote the advancement and diffusion of knowledge and understanding. The intersection of food, family, and community is special for many of us but it's been a particularly noteworthy part of Rose Previtt's life and her career. Rose grew up in small-town Ohio, the daughter of an Italian-American father and a Lebanese-American mother. From road trips to Detroit's Lebanese grocery stores, kind of like my road trips to Los Angeles Indian grocery stores, to running an Italian sausage stand, I didn't do that, Rose's childhood was filled with the flavors of her family's heritage. In their fairly homogenous town, her family saw food as an opportunity to educate others about their culture. Rose got her start in DC working in human rights advocacy, but after traveling across the world with her husband, including an epiphany that she had on the Trans-Siberian Railroad, Rose returned to DC with a new mission, and that was to bring international kitchens and their hospitality to the plates of Americans. Rose now owns two award-winning restaurants, Compass Rose and Maidan. They both showcase dishes from around the world. Now, Rose doesn't just bring diners a unique experience. She wants them to remember that behind our richly diverse cultures, we all want the same things, good food and good company to share it with. Rose and I chatted in Compass Rose's Bedouin tent to talk food and family and what she'd serve lawmakers who were looking for an immigration compromise. Thank you very much for joining today. I'm very happy to be talking to you here in my uh, Bedouin tent. In your Bedouin tent? I have never done an interview in a Bedouin tent. I'm so glad that we're the first. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we are here in your Bedouin tent in an alley in Washington, D.C. Yes. My first question, why did you call it Compass Rose? I decided to call my first restaurant Compass Rose because it's about travel. Everything here concept-wise, inspiration-wise, is about travel. So I kept, I was stuck on the compass since that signifies to me 
you know, the essence of travel. It would make people think, what's in that place? So I was researching and realized that the nautical compass is actually called a compass rose, officially. With my name being Rose, it seemed like the perfect fit. I always wanted it to be a neighborhood gathering place. Friends of mine <laughs> were even like, it should be Rose's place. I'm like, well, that sounds like a diner, and we're not a diner. Um, so to me, it had a little bit of the exotic, but also that at-home feeling, which is the essence of the restaurant. We want you to feel like you're traveling all over the world, but you haven't really left the confines of a comfortable space and, and home, really. Mm -hmm. It's in a 130-year-old row house, after all, but it has a Bedouin tent in the back. So you can see the theme. It's right. like exotic, but homey. <laughs> so speaking of home, what was it like to grow up in Toledo, Ohio? Uh, well, officially, for those at home listening, I, it was my hometown is Ada, Ohio, yeah. but it's close to Toledo. That's Got my it. reference okay. point. Mm -hmm. um, it was a beautiful place to grow up. I had the most lovely childhood. Um, my dad was a college professor at Ohio Northern University, which is located there. And the only downside being it wasn't super diverse. And both of my parents had grown up in very ethnic communities. My dad in an Italian-American community in New Jersey. My mom in a Lebanese-American community in Detroit. So it was just like they were like hyper aware of their food and their culture. And so to come to a place that didn't have anyone from those communities was just a little bit surprising. But they took it upon themselves to educate everyone about where we came from. And so we did that through food, um, really, via my mom's catering business, via my dad's street food hobby, via... Street food hobby? Who, what's, yeah, who, a, what's a street food hobby? College professors that have street food hobbies, yes, that's yes, not that's... normal. <laughs> that's about as normal as a better intent in the back of a restaurant in D.C. Um, my dad grew up in Jersey, and his father's family had immigrated not you know my dad was born in the states but the immigrant success story of our family was my grandfather's uh, grocery store it was an Italian grocery store and butcher shop in New Jersey and he had this secret recipe for Italian sausage that was very famous do you have it I know it in my head. Wow. We don't write it down. I mean, no, people course, could steal course, it that right. way. <laughs> We're also very old school and, and suspicious of everybody. But this recipe, I think my dad you know, embraced because he didn't take over the family business. I think there was an element of guilt because he was the first one in his family to go to college, hmm. which is a very common immigrant story. Your family fights to get to the United States to get you a better life and a better education, but sometimes you end up moving away from the family and from the family business, and that's what my dad did. And he became a college professor, but this connection, I think, to his upbringing and to his background was this recipe, as well as just the culture of the grocery store and bringing people together around food. And so we would go to fairs and festivals on the weekends in my entire childhood. Spring, summer, and fall. Winter was the only reprieve. We had an Italian sausage stand, and we would make what's very common at festivals here, like in New Jersey, New York, sausage sandwiches. But we made them in our kitchen all mm -hmm. week long, and then we sold 300 or so on a Saturday and Sunday. Really? Um, very popular in the community. Nobody had had it there before because, again, it just didn't have that kind of ethnic community. So we did that. Um, my mom did the Lebanese stuff um, through her business, and we did you know weddings, graduation parties, um, and just from kids coming over to to hang out. My mom insisted on making a full meal, no excuses to not sit at the table, even with your friends over. And instead of pizza and Mountain Dew like the other kids got, um, we did raw lamb, baked kibbe, uh -huh. um, tabbouleh salads, uh, homemade pastas, things that no one had had before. Not cool when you're young, but by high school, people you, were you like, were, yeah. You were the bomb, right? Yeah, yeah, we're really popular by high school when kids like eating, and it's like, oh yeah, right. Uh, so it came full circle. And now full circle that I have two restaurants based on my background, so my parents are very smug now. Like, you complain about those Saturday mornings, well, you have a street look food. Look at you now, right? You have a street food restaurant. It's so it all worked out for you. So. You're making money off this hobby now. Oh yeah, yeah. Tables so, have turned. So growing up, how much time did you spend with your grandparents in Jersey? Every summer, both my parents were teachers. My dad was a professor. My mom, she was a teacher who, when not catering, was substitute teaching when we were kids. So um, they had summers off, mm -hmm. and everyone had summer off. So we would go visit my grandfather. My grandmother had passed away already, so it was just him and my uncle. And they lived in this big house together. And we'd hang out at the store, which had, by that point, uh, most of my childhood, another family was running it. Um, we'd just sit there, and the whole neighborhood was still Italian. So everyone would come in and speak in Italian mm -hmm. and catch up and, you know, shoot the breeze and all that stuff. Um, so it was a really cool thing for me to see that kind of community as well. What about your mother's side of the family? Did you go to, to Detroit? I went to Detroit for everything, for all yeah. the holidays, as well as to kind of stock up on Lebanese staples like tahini and pita bread and all the things that we needed to cook. And they were just kind of these 
missions, you know, up right. to Toledo and Detroit, spend a whole weekend with our family, stock up the minivan, and then come back to Ada, Ohio with all of our wares. <laughs> I had the same experience growing up in Salinas. My parents, you know, came from Pakistan, mm -hmm. and we'd drive all the way to Los Angeles six hours oh, wow. to go to the Asian food store to buy hot sauces, rices, uh, spices. Oh, six I, hours. You beat me. And I remember the smell of those places, right? Oh, the Lebanese store is yeah. a very distinct. Like, that's how I judge them even nowadays. If I walk into a Lebanese bakery or a Middle Eastern spice shop, I know if it's good or not <laughs> right away <laughs> just by the smell. But six hours is a bigger trek. It's they so were dedicated. It's crazy yeah. to think in Southern California they didn't have that closer to them. Oh, yeah. Uh, no, this was pretty close. Um, it was about an hour to get there, hour oh. and a half. So then what took you from, you know, growing up in Ohio to Compass Rose? What's the story of you becoming a... A uh, restaurant tour. <laughs> <laughs> well, it didn't start with restaurant touring right. at all. That's why. Um, I graduated from college in Ohio, and I wanted to fix the world, save the world. So that's what I came to do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I started interning at Human Rights Watch, where I wanted to start working with... I, I was working on the um, in the Americas Division, actually, on um, anti-death penalty stuff with some amazing people who were dedicating their life to human rights violations. And um, I was really into it. I'd been studying in college, so it was so cool to be with the people <coughs> whose work I had been reading, you know, while I was in school. Um, I really wanted to work, actually, with Mexican immigrants... I was thinking I was going to go to law school at the time, and I would do immigration law. That was my plan right off the bat. Uh, but they didn't have any money to pay me, so I worked for free, and I went to what I know, which is food. And I started uh, serving tables at a bar, very much a bar, not a restaurant, on Capitol Hill, where I ended up working for seven years as a bartender, a manager, a server. I met my husband there. I met a lot of my best friends there. My now business partner owned that bar while I was working there. So that is how it started. Mm -hmm policy school, working in nonprofits, but always bartending or being in restaurants on the side. Still not thinking it was going to be like my actual career yep. until we moved abroad for four years. We were in Moscow, Russia, while he was a foreign correspondent for NPR, covering the whole former Soviet Union. And we traveled like crazy people. And when you travel, as you know, uh, you have time to reflect, you have time to really think, as opposed to like working two jobs and going to school. All of a sudden, I wasn't working. I was following kind of my husband around, which was not ideal in some ways. But the positive side was I got to really think about my life and what really made me happy. And with an epiphany on the Trans-Siberian Railroad somewhere in Siberia, I was really Where honest most, with myself. More, most epiphanies happen, let's be clear. Oh, yeah. And let me tell you, if you're looking for one, you should go to Siberia in January or December uh, when it's super, super cold on the train. Be on the train for like 70 hours and then amazing things happen to your mind, <laughs> both good and bad. Um, I think like, you know, I was really honest, bore my soul. And I was like, you know, the food is what really makes me happy. Traveling and food. And how can I merge those things? And as I started talking to my husband about this, you know, I had this very specific background, but this, our travels were really, had been what defined the last three years of my life. And I thought, how cool to put it all in one menu. And I call it street food because truly most of our original dishes at the restaurant and, and what we were most proud of from our travels were street food dishes, things that David and I had found when we got lost. When we showed up somewhere and had no idea where we were, but were starving from some long delayed flight, um, and we'd find the first thing, some kebab that we'd find on the street. And we had such really cool memories associated with the food that we thought, I think we can make a menu out of this. And I met an amazing chef um, who got my vision, that business partner of mine who used to own that bar. I showed up at his door with a six pack of beer and I said, hey, I want to open a business. I don't know how, but you do. You want to help me? And he's now my business partner at both restaurants. And we just kind of left the old stuff behind. Now, I use my policy background. I got all my permits for myself. Um, I dealt with a lot of the red tape because I'd gone to school for it. Uh, so education is never a waste, kids. Don't think that's what I'm saying. <laughs> um, but I did change tracks um, in my early 30s. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and do you feel like, um, you know, as, as you look ahead in your career, do you have a vision of wanting to kind of bring back that policy and advocacy mindset to the work that you do serving people food? Well, I already do. That business partner has to remind me sometimes that we are not an advocacy organization <laughs> and we are for profit. And I like, I didn't come to DC to work for profit. This was a twist. Um, what I found though is that I, I do have a space 
And whenever we can use that space to fundraise or to help others, we do. And we've had some really, you know, cool groups that we partner with um, here in D.C., as well as a few D.C.-based but international organizations. Uh, people right now, food gets attention. And anything we can do to use our platform to raise awareness about issues that we care about, we, we do. And maybe it's living in D.C. I mean, I have to be fair. The demographic here, everyone does things like you do all day long. They work to help people. They work for causes. And they really connect to what we're doing. They love the travel concept. They love that it's street food. It's not elevated fancy food. It's like, so it really reminds people of places that they've been. We have State Department, Foreign Service, you know, Peace Corps volunteers as our regular customers. Mm -hmm. So they really connect. But then they also come to us when they need help for something. So we have done a number of partnerships, including N Street Village, which is a women's shelter in Logan Circle right down the street. There are regular partners here at Compass Rose. Um, at Maidan, because it's more of a Middle Eastern concept, uh, we were approached by the Karam Foundation out of Chicago. They work with Syrian refugee youth. Um, mm -hmm. They have a couple houses in Turkey. They do a number of things. Um, but we've done a few fundraisers for them. We're going to go volunteer in Turkey at one of their houses oh, in really? August. The chefs and I are going to go teach them how to make American food uh -huh. for five days. So you don't have to give up that stuff. You don't have to give up that side of you just because you have a restaurant. So. so as I was preparing for the conversation, I read that as you were planning, whether it was this restaurant or Maidan, you and your chefs actually travel to different countries to learn recipes. Yeah. Right? So as you're describing to your customers those experiences, what's the experience that, you know, kind of uh, breaks through for somebody that says, oh, I can see a grandmother making that dish? Oh, well, there's, we've had a few because they, we went to five countries to plan Maidan because I'm not in the kitchen full time, right? I grew up with this kind of food. They didn't. Both the guys are local to D.C. and don't have Middle Eastern backgrounds. So I said, look, this is my soul food. Like, the only way to learn this food, there's no recipes. These were learned from my grandmother. So you need to go. And my grandmother's not here anymore. So we have to go to them. I mean, you have to really feel these places. And so... Even just saying that, a lot of people connect to because they've been, you know, everyone can relate to their grandmother or their mother and, and cooking with them. And um, if you know these countries, you know Morocco, Tunisia, Lebanon, Turkey, the Republic of Georgia, they don't have a restaurant culture like we do. Most of the best food is out on the streets, made by local people, and everybody knows the good ones and, you know, is very proud of their, like, their neighborhood spot. But the next best place was in the kitchens. And a lot of women, especially in North Africa and parts of the Middle East, are not working. So even if you went to the restaurants, I had a Tunisian grandma who told me, she's like, it's the men in the restaurants making the food. They don't know what they're doing. We make the food. <laughs> she goes, so it's good that you came here. And they let us into their homes. Um, and this Tunisian woman in particular, she was very special. She is writing a cookbook in English on Tunisian food because there is not one. There wasn't one before hers. And she brought us into her kitchen and she said, you know, my grandmother's age, my, my mother's age very much wanted to be French. If you had any money in education, you were connected to your French colonists, you know, almost the enemy in some ways. But they were very bougie. I mean, this is her words, you know, and they made French food. She goes, but I connected to my grandmother and I cooked with her. And she said, no, this is the food of our country and this is what I'm going to teach you. And that's what they taught us to make. And so when we tell that story you can just see this like you know hot kitchen with no air conditioning um and this beautiful grandma who's just making couscous by hand and showing us how you know her harissa is better than everybody else in the neighborhood's harissa and so that is one of the particular you know ones that stand out but that's where all the good stuff is it's in the grandma's kitchen and when the grandmas get competitive you get a very good meal oh yeah step back like yeah <laughs> the guy and the chefs were so respectful and just absorbed what these women were telling them and came back and just reproduced it so beautifully I'm so proud of them um, not everybody can do that right so we're here your staff is pre preparing for an evening of dining so let's say walking in you have you know 10 members of Congress five Democrats five Republicans mm. who are you know they've agreed to go to dinner to just to decide okay well, this is how we're gonna fix the immigration system what's the meal that you would serve them that would get them to an agreement well, fortunately, we have a thing here called the Tour of the World. <laughs> so glad you asked. Um, we recommend it for anyone coming to Compass Rose with a group. And honestly, we can do it for two. But in this particular instance, it would be a larger group. Um, we have about 15 countries represented on the menu at any given time. 
and the tour of the world is a selection of the majority of them, kind of the greatest hits, and it is catered to the, your size group, and you will get so many different flavors from the entire world, which I think is very important for this conversation. You're gonna get, you know, Mexico, North America, South America, Asia, like, I would make them try all of it. Because <laughs> this is where you're gonna really get the information that you need, right? If you're open to everybody's way of thinking, and. You know, at both restaurants, bread is one of our main components. Here, hajapuri is a Georgian cheese bread that's the national dish of Georgia, and my husband and I ate way too much of it in Russia and couldn't believe when we came back to the States six years ago that we couldn't find it. So I was like, well, we're going to make it then because people need to know what this dish is. At Maidan, we do a flatbread in a tandoori-style oven, which the Georgians call tone. So both places, Georgian bread is the focus. And I would make them absolutely break this bread together. And I really think that when you're eating, your vulnerabilities go down and you're doing this fundamental thing that everyone has in common, that everyone has to do and most people really, really enjoy doing. And um, I think it opens up your mind and heart a little bit to what people have to say. So you've had this amazing experience uh, traveling the world, learning food, about food around the world. You're now serving food yes. to the world in DC. Let's say you go back to Toledo. So it's kind of the same question, but what would you, when you were heading to the festival on a Saturday, <laughs> uh, would, would you break out the sausage recipe? What would you, what would you serve people in Toledo who are struggling with this issue to bring your vision to that, that moment? Am I allowed a couple of dishes? It's your world. Yeah, be yeah, 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 because your, really that's, it's your menu. that's the whole thing about Compass is that it pulls from everywhere to mm -hmm. show, you know, our sameness, even though the flavors are a little bit different. Mm -hmm. We all fit on one menu together. I mean, that's our mission. So I'd probably bring my little tour of the world uh, to Toledo. And also Toledo has some amazing immigrant communities, actually, that I, I grew up, you know, eating in little hole in the wall spots that were awesome. And you wouldn't even know we're in Toledo, Ohio. But at my little street stand, I would want you to get this little platter of all the flavors to show that this is this major thing that we have in common and why would we treat each other any differently? Why would we keep, how could we keep the people that hold these beautiful treasures out of our country <laughs> for fear of who they are? We also talk about not just bringing the food back from the countries we went to, but the hospitality. We as Americans were welcomed into these homes of people that had no idea who we were. We were fed, we were treated like kings and queens. You know, that is, what we want to bring to our restaurants, but that's what we as the United States should be doing. Like here, strangers from other places, learn our cultures, learn our traditions, come into our homes and eat around our tables. That's the essence of life. That's, that's how we share. And um, we just feel a huge responsibility back to the people who welcomed us, North Africa, the Middle East, countries that, you know, again, on the news, all we're hearing are the negative things. We didn't see or feel one negative thing in any of the five countries we went to. And of course, they're everywhere. We have plenty of that. One of our mottos of the trip was same but different, especially in the Middle East, where a lot of people claim the same dish, right? Like, we'll have grandmas walk in and say, oh, that hummus, where do you say it's from? And we say, well, it's from the Middle East. And they say, well, it's Israeli. Or no, it's from Jordan. Or no, and we say, I tell the staff, don't even get into these conversations. Everything we do here is to show that we're all the same, fundamentally want the same things, education for our children, good food on our table, and jobs um, that give back to the community. Like, we all want the same thing. So how could we possibly shut our doors to people just like us. But you're right. I mean, that's that's the message that I think we have to articulate to folks who are in the middle of the country to unfairly stereotype, but who are struggling with this. It's to help people feel okay being different but the same. Yeah. It's yeah. not something to be afraid of. Right. And it's you can get this vision in your mind. Our wine director, Maria Bastash, is brilliant. Our wine list is also very indicative of lesser known parts of the world that make wine, that people don't even know make wine. When Compass Rose opened and she took over, I said, look, you might be from California, but you can never have a California wine on here. Everybody in America knows that there's wine from California. I barely want any French. I barely want any Italian. I want you to go to the far corners of the earth and bring me Macedonian, Slovenian, from Jordan, from Georgia, from Lebanon, places that people don't even know produce wine. We just went to Mexico. Mexico. Nobody thinks of wine in Mexico. They think of tequila and mezcal. Definitely not wine. Just like my parents wanted to kind of educate the people in my community in Ohio growing up, we want to even show the educated, well-traveled people of D.C., very diverse population, right, that even they don't know where some of these really cool things are coming from. Because yeah. when you think of Lebanon or Syria, you don't think of wine, right? We have our staff close their eyes when they're tasting the Syrian wine. And we say, what do you think when you think of Syria? And they all say bombs and, you know, war. And we're like, this wine came from there. These grapes were planted hundreds of years ago. Think of Napa. There's a Napa in Syria. There is a Napa in Lebanon. There's, oh God, Georgia is 
gorgeous. People think of the former Soviet Union and like people still ask questions like, did you have toilet paper when you were in Moscow? I'm like, guys, it was the year 2009 when I was there. Of course we had toilet paper. But they had this vision of these faraway places that are so unsophisticated, maybe even dangerous. And I'm like, dangerous people are not producing this wine for you. <laughs> um, so let it into the country. Let it cross our borders and let the people that make it come in too. Uh-huh. My last question for you podcast is called Only in America, yes. and I ask everybody the same question of, just to complete the sentence, only in America, dot, dot, dot. Only in America could a young woman from a tiny little town in Ohio have made her way to D.C. and now own two award-winning restaurants that she's very proud of. Thank you. Really, really appreciate it. This is a lot of fun. Thank, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for coming and sitting <laughs> in my Bedouin tent. <laughs> Rose Previtt is an award-winning restaurateur based in Washington, D.C. You can find more information on Rose and her restaurants at immigrationforum.org. Only in America is produced and edited by Emily Chow, Joanna Taylor, and Megan Wetmore. Kathleen Farrell is the executive producer, and I'm Ali Nirani. Thank you so much for listening to Only in America, and I will talk to you next week.